Thank you very much. First, it's a, on behalf of the Cities Alliance, it's a real pleasure to be back at the Woodrow Wilson and to co-host this, this event. I'm very grateful for the opportunity and I'm sorry Blair isn't but here to join us, but thank you, Alison, for, for stepping in. It's just over two years since we uh, removed from Washington and Brussels, but it's wonderful to be able to come back and, and engage with the same practitioners and some new faces uh, around these topics. So I don't have a PowerPoint, which I'm delighted by, as you've seen the technical problems. Um, and I'm not going to focus only on secondary cities, but rather in the context of the adoption of SDG Goal 11 and all of the SDGs, try and think through some of the challenges that we will face collectively in implementing uh, the goal of sustainable cities, which is not a new goal, but what is new is that the, for the first time is that we have global recognition of the importance of cities, both as objects of uh, the need for assistance and indeed as players in their own right, and I think this is the important bit. And there's two parts to this equation. I'm, I was prompted by one of Shomik's comments uh, because I'm going to focus really on the national and local environments that impact. But I also, we also do need to think about, and we have been doing this in the Cities Alliance, is what does this mean uh, for development agencies and partners in terms of how fit for purpose are they to actually engage with cities as independent actors? And I think the answer is, is it needs more detailed uh, work, but is, is the question is being asked. And, uh, reference was made to the complementarity of different services, how you can't do the one without the other. And this is absolutely the case at a city level. And so, I mean, I've been, like many of you, I've been messing around in cities for over three decades. I have yet to come across anywhere in the world a city of any size where everything works perfectly and smoothly except water. That's what will be offered from the development agency. They'll come in with one sector and say, sorry, this year we're doing water. You've, we've got a wash program or an energy program. That's what's on the offer. So generally speaking, where cities have a difficulty in one sector, they have it in multiple sectors. But that's not how the development agencies respond. And we're going to have to rethink technical assistance and support and lending to cities if this is going to become a new line of business. So in the context of the adoption of Sustainable Goal 11, and as we move forward to Habitat 3, uh, I want to remind us ourselves of, of two of the mantras that we have, and we would be as guilty as any agency of, of using this kind of evangelical language in making the case for cities. Uh, there's two things that we would have said in various forms over the last decade. One is drawing attention to the linkages between urbanization and growth linkages, not necessarily causality, and secondly, using the mantra, which is that cities are the drivers of economic growth. We've all heard it many times. And both of those are accurate, but with major, major conditions. There is nothing automatic about either. And in fact, urbanization can lead to the worsening of conditions in badly run cities. And a badly run city is not going to prosper and promote economic growth either for itself or for its citizens. And so what are the essential conditions that we need to address, we again collectively, I don't think this is the job of the development agencies except to think about their roles in this. And I want to focus on three baskets of challenges that I think need to be addressed as we move forward uh, in responding to not only goal 11, but the whole range of, of uh, targets and goals across all 17, which may or may not be too many. The first, and I'm not going to surprise you, none of this is new. Uh, don't look for magic. Look for the good old dull stuff of what makes development work and ma makes countries work and what makes cities work. Area number one, what is the constitutional, legal, and fiscal policy framework within which those cities operate? Is there clarity between the tiers of government? Are the laws clear? Are our responsibilities assigned accurately? Is there overlap between jurisdictions and functions? Is the fiscal transfer system stable, predictable, and usable? This is such a major question. It attracts not enough attention. And very few cities are going to be to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, to achieve what we're talking about in secondary cities, 
Cities need power, authority, and agency to be able to do what makes sense for that city. In other words, we have to allow cities to respond differently to the same sets of challenges. And that's, I believe, where innovation really needs to come from. Most developmental frameworks, most constitutional, legal, and fiscal policy frameworks, number one, are way better in the rhetoric than they are in the application. So most governments do have legislation for de decentralization, but it is not applied, which allows Brian to say decentralization has largely failed and not be challenged. But the point is it, the principle of subsidiarity, of, of having the right function, the right powers, and the right resources at the appropriate level is an absolute precondition for achieving sustainable goal 11. And this re requires a major amount of attention. The second basket of challenges is in the policy response of the city governments themselves. So very often city local governments will present themselves as the victims of a bad policy environment, yet at the same time take a set of policy decisions at the local level either by acts of omission or commission, and themselves exacerbate the problem. They very often, in, in all of our experience, most local governments do not focus on the whole city and all citizens at the same time. We have very particular picking out of working in certain parts of the city, but ignoring significant populations. And this is most obviously the case where you have massive informal growth where the slums are not on the map and are not seen to be vital for the p political future of that local authority to address. And so you have unplanned, unaddressed informal settlements. We have, uh, in many cases, uh, anti-poor policies in effect uh, implemented, if not in name, in practice by many local governments. A lack of appropriate planning, and in this I would really include a lack of future planning. And uh, some of the best work that we are supporting at this time in, in some parts of Africa is working with local governments to try and anticipate future population growth, most of which will, by the way, will be natural population growth rather than, rather than migration, which is as predictable and as certain as it can be. And, and to think about what your city will look like, not next year and not next election, but two or preferably three decades from now, and to start moving your administrative boundaries now so you can start planning for the services that will certainly be necessary. The alternative, of course, you saw in the photographs from Esri, which is the retrofitting which will dominate most city uh, activities in Latin America for the foreseeable future. Africa has got an opportunity to do a combination of retrofitting and forward planning. But the default position of most cities is to act after the event, which of course is the most efficient, inefficient and most expensive way of doing city planning, but it has a long and proud history in, in urban planning throughout the world. So, and we have to also pick up on the point that as things stand at the moment under currency, current policy directions, most growth in African cities and South Asian cities, Southeast Asian, continues to be informal. Most development continues to be incremental and our policy advice to governments in that regard is take that as your starting point and work with it rather than fight against it. And don't, plan from, don't start planning from where you think you should be, but rather from where you are. But this is not a, a very popular uh, approach. The third challenge that I would put on the table is, in my personal opinion, maybe the most difficult of all. And that is that even as we celebrate SDG goal 11 and, and try and promote the role of cities to achieve this. Most cities that we're talking about, and here I really do pay attention to the secondary cities, but this also includes mega cities, have neither the resources nor the skills at this point in time to do what we claim they have to do. And unless we completely rethink our approach to the, the opportunities provided for working at local government, the need to professionalize the local civil service, and to put it very clearly and provocatively, to turn working in local government a preferred choice of professionals and a career opportunity, unless we think like that, who's going to be running the cities that we are talking about? And we can all give you numbers of how many urban planners there are 
not in that city, but in that country. We're just starting a, a long-term work program in Monrovia, Liberia, post Ebola, and working with the mayor in the first instance for five years just to try and rethink the city. There are seven urban planners in Liberia, four of whom are in the private sector. This is actually not a bad proportion compared to other countries. But <coughs> I'm making a general point. What skill capacity does the fifth biggest city in Burkina Faso have to run that city? Has anyone thought about it? How are we going to run these cities? We is very collective. Traditional approaches to capacity building and workshops, not gonna cut it at all. We need, in my view, a 10 to 20 year major program of rethinking first and foremost what is taught at universities. So we are not teaching post-colonial master planning to cities that are doubling in size in 15 years. So unless we start looking at the human and resource capital for the, that are gonna be needed in hundreds of cities across Africa, in hundreds of cities across South and Southeast Asia, then our celebrations for SDG 11 may be more than a little premature. So it is good, uh, if anything, the time frame between now and 2030 is far too short. Uh, we are talking about a multi-generational um, set of activities, but of constant activity, constant policy revision, starting now. But we have to be thinking about the big picture and the glacial, uh, or the glaciers that we need to move, because as excited as we get about the language, technology alone is not going to run these cities. It'll help, but we actually need an entire new civil service to run these cities. So I leave those thoughts with you at the end. Thank you very much.